Neil Armstrong took us, took us through a dress rehearsal or a typical instrument landing glide slope uh, procedure showing how he'll do the PDI, the Power Descent Initiate Burn tomorrow, to bring Eagle, their lunar module, down to the landing site, lunar landing site two there. And even more important was that he was right on the money, right on the right track, but not four or five miles south, as Apollo 10 had been over that same site. Uh, apparently, the LOI burn, the trajectory and navigation guidance work, has been absolutely flawless. Armstrong appears to be all set up. Well, and uh, as one of the men just said, it uh, looks like the lamb is ready to go down, wants to go down. Well, it's, uh, in a way, a million light years between the flight of... Uh, the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, but it's not, not so very long at that when you stop to think of the actual calendar time. But of course, there have been tremendous strides. Nobody could have dreamed, uh, no realist, I guess, could have dreamed when the, at the time of the Wright brothers' flight that uh, less than 70 years later, people would actually be on the surface of the moon. Let's, uh, we have a film package for you. Uh, ABC's Don North has put it together to uh, just trace the history of flight. Here's Don North. Incredible as it may seem, there is only 66 years between this, the first successful aircraft to fly, and the flight of the Apollo 11 spacecraft. 66 years between the flight of Wilbur Wright and Neil Armstrong. It was in this aircraft, a frail combination of wire, wood, and cloth, on December 17, 1903, that Wilbur Wright launched on the sands at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and flew for 12 seconds. He covered a distance of 120 feet. A modest beginning, with few Americans realizing the significance of this achievement. The Wright brothers alone seemed to realize the significance of what they had done. Later, Orville Wright said that it was the first time in the history of the world in which a machine carrying man had raised itself by its own power, raised itself into free flight, and sailed forward on a level course without reduction of speed, and finally landed without being wrecked. A single still photographer was there to record the event. He made this photo. There were no newsmen present. Later, only one newspaper, the Norfolk, Virginia pilot, printed the story, but they got most of the facts wrong. This film shows an early glider flight about 1902. It was through their experiments with kites and gliders that the Wright brothers developed their successful aircraft. Seen directing operations here, Wilbur Wright on the left. After 1903, the Wright brothers flew their planes in Europe for the governments of France, Germany, and Italy and achieved worldwide attention. This is the younger Orville Wright. In 1909, they demonstrated this aircraft for the U.S. Army at Fort Myer, Virginia. With Lieutenant Frank Lahm as the passenger, Orville Wright, shown here, satisfied the Army's requirements and Secretary of War Howard Taft awarded them a prize of $30,000. It was in Italy before King Emmanuel that some of the finest film of the Wright brothers' early flights was made. The European powers were very interested in developing the airplane for military purposes, and later Orville Wright was to regret the use of the aircraft he developed in war. He said, I feel about it as much as I do about fire. I regret its danger, but I'm glad the human race discovered it. This is a catapult launch similar to the idea of a launch from a modern aircraft carrier. There was a brave cameraman here. Notice they never flew very high, about 30 to 50 feet in those days. They weren't too sure of themselves. It was during this demonstration that the first film was made in the air. An intrepid cameraman climbed aboard beside Orville Wright, and they took off down the launch pad to take the first film shot from an airplane. All right, they've just received the go signal from uh, Mission Control to undock. That will take place uh, around on the far side of the moon. So Jules, Eagle, and Columbia will now come into their own, won't they, on their own? They're on their own, and uh, they are pretty well committed at this point, and no one's particularly concerned about it. Eagle has uh, checked out amazingly well, far better than it, uh, or most lunar modules uh, and most command modules have done on the ground, and certainly better than any of the astronauts have been able to do in the simulators. It seems to be the story which Stafford and Frank Warman and many other astronaut space commanders have told us that when you get up there in the real vehicle, it's much easier than in, in all the practice sessions. It's much, e much easier 
than in the hundreds of hours in altitude chambers and in test uh, rigs on the ground. The real thing is always easier to fly. And uh, this is the way it will be. This is the way it is now, we should say. Just before undocking, which takes place on the far side of the moon, with uh, the command module, Columbia, on the left-hand side of our frame, of course, docked to Eagle, the lunar module, both of them passing in an orbit some 60, 60 miles over the moon. Actually, the orbit varies between 55.9 and 63 nautical miles over the moon's surface. Mike Collins alone now in the command module. Let's go air to, to Houston for a little air to ground in these final moments before loss of signal. We just heard Collins talking to Capcom Charlie Duke. Let's see if we can pick them up again. There's the scene in Apollo Control in Houston. Some tenseness at the consoles. A quiet scene, a busy scene, as they watch and wait. As flight director Gene Kranz, an expert of this kind of thing, the flight director in charge of the descent maneuver and the lunar touchdown, has his team drilled. Go ahead, Columbia, over. Go ahead, Columbia, over. Switching antenna positions, which is why the signal has suddenly gotten scratchy there. As Eagle and Columbia go over the hill, as the astronauts call it, around the western side of the moon. Apollo 11 is on the far side of the moon, and we are about 25 minutes away now from the point at which they will undock to separate the two spacecraft, Eagle and Columbia. And Jules Bergman is down in our mock-up of uh, Eagle with Dick Sprague. Jules? Frank, we're in our own eagle, if you will, our lunar module mock-up here at ABC Space Headquarters with Grumman Consulting Pilot Dick Sprague, who's right now in what everybody's going to hear is the CDR station, the spacecraft commander station, where Neil Armstrong will be flying eagle down to the landing, uh, uptight, if you will, to that uh, triangular window, Dick. Is that right? Right. This will be Neil's position as he's approaching the surface. Right. Now, what, Dick, these landing scribes of the LTD, the landing point designator, looks like an old-fashioned reticle, a crosshair, and a telescopic set on the rifle. What does Neil do with that? Well, when he stands in the correct position, or the design eye position, aligns these scribes on the inner and outer glasses, he is then looking out uh, at a point on the lunar surface when the computer tells him to. Right. And it tells him how many degrees down on that scribe line to look. He will then be looking at the point that the computer is, has decided to land him at. For example, if it says 33 degrees, as it not right. only does in the flight plan at right. uh, low gate, that's where 500 feet above the moon's surface, that's where Neil wants it to be, and Buzz, I'm standing in Buzz Aldrin's position here, Buzz wants it to be, for the actual lunar touchdown. We're going to take, take you through that touchdown now via, via animated film, picking up with the undocking that's due to take place about 25 minutes from now on the 13th revolution of Eagle and Columbia, their command module, as they pass behind the moon, the far side of the moon. As the animation shows, the two vehicles undock and pull away from one another, and Neil and Buzz are there in Eagle, their command module, getting ready to start down. There they are, tight at the windows, as Dick Sprague showed us. The descent engine fires that 10,500 pound dips engine, as you'll hear it called, in the DOI, or Descent Orbit Insertion Maneuver, which will lower their altitude from 60 miles around the moon, which is what is it now, down to the 50,000 feet where Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan in Snoopy, their lunar module on Apollo 10 got to. Then after successfully getting down to 50,000 feet, and what really is a continuous maneuver, they do the PDI, or Power Descent Initiate uh, Burn, which takes them from 50,000 feet down to the moon's surface. PDI begins 260 miles west of uh, the landing site in the Sea of Tranquility, slowing them down all the way until they finally do the final descent vertically like a helicopter, coming down very, very slowly to what should be a smooth landing. The actual landing area, a 3.2 by 1.6 mile ellipse in the Sea of Tranquility, 
about a mile and a half by about four miles in size. Uh, all the maps so far indicate that ellipse is smooth, that Armstrong and Aldrin should have no trouble. That's the way it'll look as they touch down on the moon's surface. 